There is nothing so American as our parks. Or as President Franklin Roosevelt, who helped create so many, said, the fundamental idea behind the parks is that the country belongs to the people. Simply put, this is your view. Your canyon filled with such amazing light and color. Here for you and here for generations to come. This is your waterfall and your rushing stream. This is your horse trail, your historic town. It is where your children can learn about their roots. This stone bridge, these rustic cabins, this legacy is all yours. They are Arkansas State Parks and they belong to you. Today, there are 52 state parks across Arkansas and each year they attract almost 10 million visitors. There are over 1,700 campsites, almost 200 cabins, four lodges with 218 guest rooms, not to mention over 300 miles of trails, swimming pools, golf courses, museums, 183 historic structures, and six national historic landmarks, and so much more. And there are activities, from the adrenaline pumping action of a mountain stream, to the serene moments of trout fishing, from campfires to cycling. The opportunities offered are boundless. To these Arkansas parks come adventurers and families and school children. And it all began with an idea that one great place should be shared. The whole concept of park was unknown. It was an American concept. It was less than 30 years old. And so they, they, it was a job. They were building something, but what's a park? I mean, that's hard for us to understand, but in the 1930s, the, the whole idea was brand new. The idea of parks, national and state parks, was the grand idea of a new century. In 1916, the National Park Service was created by Congress. But nine years earlier in Arkansas, the notion to create a park on Pettigene Mountain had taken hold. A party of owners and managers of the Fort Smith Lumber Company came to inspect a sawmill, but were inspired by what they found. A mountain of immense beauty. But what made the mountain so beautiful also made logging unprofitable. And so the idea of a park began. Living on the mountain was the lumber company's physician, Dr. T.W. Hardison. Not just the camp doctor, he was a naturalist. By 1921, the company was ready to donate scenic lands for a national park. Hardison went to the director of the new National Park Service with an offer. Stephen Mather, who was the director of the National Park Service, came to visit and he said, it's beautiful and it's pretty, but it's not big enough for a national park and, and in his view, not scenic enough. He, he was sort of a Grand Canyon kind of guy. And he says, what you need is a state park system. And uh, nobody really knew what that was. Dr. Hardison took up the challenge, lobbying state lawmakers and the governor, and by 1923, it was agreed Arkansas could have its own park. But it would be 10 years before the parkland began to look like a park. In 1933, at the height of the Great Depression, Franklin Roosevelt became president. He wanted to put unemployed young men to work and establish the Civilian Conservation Corps. It was an army of workers sent to the forest lands and building parks was one of their goals. On May 18, 1933, Dr. Hardison marks a milestone in his diary. He wrote, S.G. Davies, Morrillton civil engineer here this afternoon talking with me about the park. He thinks he will be made superintendent. He is a good man for the place. And at last it appears that something will be done to make the park accessible. This was the old Creek Cabin, which we're in, which was the headquarters. Uh, this is my grandfather, who was, the again, the project superintendent. My dad, who was 19 at the time, uh, who's an engineering student. Richard Davies knows a lot about Arkansas State Parks. He was State Parks Director for 14 years and since 1990, Executive Director of the Department of Parks and Tourism. And it was his grandfather who supervised the building of that first park. He was probably the only engineer in town, and so they needed somebody to build the road up the mountain, and he was hired to do that. And then when the park project started, he was hired to be what was called project superintendent. By summer of 1933, Samuel Davies had a workforce, the CCC Boys. They'd have crews that would 
go out and uh, find the timber, and then the crews would go out and cut it, and then another the crew would go out and pick them up and haul them in. You remember laying any of these rocks in here? I didn't lay these, but I worked on that first pier there. Herman Edgens and Orville Taylor are some of the few CCC boys still alive. They worked for a dollar a day and sent most of the money home. They learned skills and self-respect and left us remarkable treasures, each building a tribute to craftsmanship and conservation. You didn't even recognize what they were doing with it, you know. They was building the cabins and all that, but uh, we didn't know what they were going to use it for. Now, I can remember my grandfather saying that they had worried that anybody would ever come, that this was, you know, on top of a mountain in the middle of nowhere. But if you read back into some of the history and some of the things that I remember, a lot of this was about access, was, was trying to get people into the wilderness, wilderness we had in the 30s, uh, but there, there wasn't much of a way to get to it or enjoy it for recreation. How long did it take you to build one of these? The Lake Pavilion at Devil's Den State Park, another CCC structure that mirrors its natural setting. Devil's Den and Crowley's Ridge were also underway in 1933. Mount Nebo, Buffalo River State Park, and Lake Catherine were soon to follow. The workmanship uh, is something that you can't replicate today. We found that out the hard way. And, and that's why it's lasted so long. They, they used traditional construction methods. Uh, they moved a lot of this stuff by hand. You know, these giant rocks, they, they'd put on pipes and 10 guys would pick it up and, and move it. And it was the sort of, uh, I guess, work that lasts forever. And it's turned out to be true in a lot of cases. The designs were inspired and meant to last. The boathouse at Pettigene, from the day it was built, looked like it belonged, through the 40s and the 50s. Even today, the classic look of the original park endures. But time and use was not always kind to parks. Slim funding and staffing from the Second World War through the 50s kept the parks busy but with rough edges. Still, parks were in demand and 10 more were created, from Bull Shoals and Mammoth Spring in the north to Lake Chico in the southeast and Daisy in the southwest. As parks were built, the visitors followed. Outdoor vacations were in vogue, and campouts and cookouts became a family affair. The visitors also helped spark a new industry, tourism. By the late 60s, Arkansas State Parks had 24 parks and they were popular but the heavy use also took its toll. The parks were still underfunded, but gaining popularity, and more communities wanted them and got them. But more parks cost more money, and Governor Dale Bumpers, taking office in 1971, met the challenge. It was an issue that we had dealt with before, is that everybody loves to build parks and nobody wants to pay to take care of them. Uh, and he put more appropriations into state parks in the early 1970s than had been spent in all the history of state parks put together. But the good works of the 70s were wearing thin in the 90s. With more parks than ever and more visitors, the parks were wearing out. If you look at the history of the state park system, it was a matter of, of good times and then some hard times, and there was never a permanent source of funding for an agency that was in the forever business. The answer to a chronic funding crisis in wear and tear was a grassroots effort for a one eight cent conservation tax. Supported by Governor Mike Huckabee and passed by voters in 1996, it was money dedicated to state parks and to the other conservation agencies. I think it's going to be diverse uh, with the spray pad. More than a decade later, the results of Amendment 75 are statewide. We have completed over $100 million of improvements, repairs, and renovations to the state park system. But there's another $200 million left to go. So we're not going to run out of work. Nothing could be further from the minds of these visitors than budgets, bricks, and mortar. Follow me. This is about a journey of discovery. A bird flies by, and did you see one? Jay Schneider is part of an 80-plus interpretive staff working in Arkansas State Parks. And this group of fifth graders has entered his classroom. The Carolina chickadee is found in Arkansas. It's really fun connecting with the kids and forging that emotional connection with them. It's really easy for me when nature cooperates as it, as it did with that red-tailed hawk calling or the, the Carolina chickadee calling and they can really see it firsthand. 
Arkansas State Parks is a real partner to education. Here in our parks, we provide an outdoor and hands-on experience about nature and history that follows the school's curriculum-based programs. For 75 years and counting, these trails at Devil's Den State Park have been taking young people along this trail of discovery. I want to come back to the state park because we didn't get to do everything, but it was a really fun experience and I'd like to do it again. All right, our next stop is the mound. Y'all ready? Yeah! Let's go. This trail is leading to something beyond the great outdoors. It is leading to a great history lesson. Now this mound is where the chief would live. So Parkin Archaeological State Park in the Arkansas Delta is home to rare history. The head pot from this prehistoric American Indian culture is not only rare, but rarely allowed on display. He gets to speak to children about where he came from, about the people that made him, and about the park itself. Unlike the classroom where they tell kids using a textbook what has happened, we get to show children exactly where history took place, and that's so important for them. And some of the history is more recent. This one-room schoolhouse was built for the black children of sawmill workers. First off, this school was built in 1910, so that means it's really This really building old. was close to Over being torn down, but alerted by the history inside, park employees peeled back the layers and then restored the schoolhouse so old lessons will speak to children. Even though it went through sharecropping and the depression and hard times, the people that sent their children here wanted their children to escape. Lessons at Parkin, some not so old, some ancient, a good set of lessons for the day. I feel like I'm connected to them. I, I feel I can relive it. Thank you. Good luck and enjoy the park. A beautiful fall day, and the visitors are converging with the trappers and traders at the rendezvous at Pinnacle Mountain State Park. Thank you. This is the muskrat, huh? Okay. Park Superintendent Ron Sally turns his park from a nature experience to a history lesson each fall. Pinnacle is known for environmental education, recreation, as well as conservation. And so anytime we can connect uh, a block of study in school, whether it's historical or civic, uh, to something that the children can actually come out and put their hands on and see with their own eyes, I think it's an important connection. And you had to ram it really good to pack that powder and bullet down you don't want History to. moves along to another park experience, Historic Washington State Park. We're preserving one of the oldest towns in the state of Arkansas. Been here incorporated and is still a living town today since 1824. They're finding out things about their own state and their own backyard that they didn't ever imagine happened here. I hope that they tell their parents that they're very proud to be an Arkansan. It's not just the kids who are searching for a new experience. Young and old seek out Crater of Diamonds State Park, the only place in the world where you can dig for diamonds and keep what you find. So what do you think about looking for diamonds? It's awesome. It's awesome. <laughs> Finding a diamond might be hard. Finding a state park interpreter who will be your guide and rock hunting mentor is easy. I get to talk to the people and I love to watch their faces when they finally understand what it is that you're trying to get across to them and uh, when you show them how to do it and you get to just interact with them. So yes, I really love it. Riding through the woods of Village Creek State Park is an experience that some would call priceless. A lot of the uh, horse trails in Arkansas are pretty rough and rocky and steep, but we have the advantage in that ours are just rolling gradual hills and all, all dirt trails and, and very little rocks. So it's easier on the horses, easier on the riders. Through the hardwood forests of beech trees and sugar maples, riders are discovering a new way to experience Arkansas State Parks. And the best part is that they have such a good experience, they tell all their friends and their friends come here. From the time he could walk, he was involved in the park system. After the office was closed, there were a lot of days when an RV would pull up and he'd be out our front door and, and telling those folks, you can park over here and you can register in the morning and the price is this much. So, you know, it's just, I, I think, in his blood. The people who work at Arkansas State Parks will tell you that this job gets in your blood. But in this case, it truly does. Josh Gossage, now a state park ranger at Lake Catherine State Park, grew up in a park. Lake Fort Smith, where his father is superintendent. And I saw how people appreciated the way he treated them, and that's something that, that's a lot of what shaped how I am. You want to treat everybody that comes into your park as family and friends. 
And that's pretty easy to do. You want to share with them what you have and let them go out and tell everybody else what, what it is we are at State Parks. Ron Gossage has plenty to share. His old park closed in 2003, but now it's remade in a new site with new facilities. I'm especially excited and pleased with the architecture and the rock work. I mean, this emulates what was built uh, by the WPA in the 1930s. This is the future of Arkansas State Parks. Here in the Boston Mountains, alongside a mountain lake, a new state park has taken shape. And State Parks Director Greg Botts is proud of what he sees. It's connecting the past to the present and it's going to move us into the future. These are great parks. Uh, they do so much for the economy. They preserve our heritage and they're all about making that emotional, intellectual connection between what's important in life. And now today, Lake Fort Smith State Park is complete. Connecting people to experiences that will become their family memories. We are having hamburgers and hot dogs. There's a new campground, lakefront pavilion, and picnic sites. And most important, park experiences that are priceless. In East Arkansas, in the St. Francis National Forest, the winds of progress are ushering in the new Mississippi River State Park. Like Mount Magazine, a partnership with the USDA Forest Service. Campgrounds and other facilities paid for with conservation fund money add to the National Forest. Other new experiences are here for Arkansas State Park visitors. A new golf course in East Arkansas at Village Creek and an updated course at DeGray Lake Resort State Park. This kind of work is possible because of the public support for conservation funding. What a perfect time of year. It's the first hint of fall and I smell wood burning. Mount Magazine, where Arkansas's newest park lodge has turned dreams into reality. First time visitors are amazed and this one, who must answer an entire state's needs, is happy of the guarantee of forever funding. If you didn't have that constant separate uh, dedicated funding source for parks, uh, they would often be left out. And uh, frankly, uh, uh, some of the heritage and preservation activities that we're watching and seeing and so proud of uh, would actually go begging because we would not be able to fund those things. In an Ozark Mountain Valley is a very different Arkansas State Park experience. It's an experience that brings people from our community to the Ozark Folk Center State Park stage to make connections with our visitors. How are you doing today, Morgan? Yeah. By day, Lisa Ray is a dental technician in Mountain View working at this clinic. So just brush real good. I know it's hard to brush when you, with all those brackets on, okay? <laughs> all right. <laughs> on most evenings, Lisa becomes a gardener, checking a bountiful harvest along the White River. What you want, Granny? Come Saturday morning, she's a top seller at the Mountain View Farmer's Market, bagging purple hull peas and selling fresh produce to her neighbors. There's a dark and a troubled side of life. But it's music that brought her family here and to the Ozark Folk Center. The Ozark Center is special to me because they are trying to preserve something that's long gone, except in Mountain View. I've never been anywhere else in, in the world that, that's like Mountain View. They just love the music, they love the old ways, and I want to be a part of that. Please make welcome Lisa Ray. Music in Mountain View reaches far beyond the park that was created to celebrate and preserve it. At Zeke's Music Store on the Square, Deanne Gillespie, Albie Talone, and Gresham McMillan rehearse a heritage tune. I feel like I'm the messenger, of, the tune is the star, and I try to play it in a way that conveys what it feels like to me, so that it touches something in somebody that hears it. The music of Deanne Gillespie is heartfelt, at times soulful, but also full of life. 
By day, she works at the dulcimer shop, tracking production and managing shipping. She's also a teacher, bringing heritage music to young people. And you'll often find her performing on the Ozark Folk Center stage at night. Tonight, she plays backup for one of her students, Emily Phillips, age 15, carrying a tradition forward. It's really rewarding to see uh, somebody that I've helped to understand the instrument better, to play the old tunes, and she just soaks it up and passes it on. I mean, she'll hopefully pass it on to other people. There's something else they pass on at the Ozark Folk Center. We call them heritage crafts. The old timers call them survival skills. No matter the name, the Ozark Folk Center preserves them and passes them on at folk schools. Our nation's Civil War heritage can be recalled in many places in Arkansas. One of them, Prairie Grove Battlefield, is a state park where a landscape is preserved and where trails now set the stage for visitors besides the markers of history. On this weekend, volunteers, not soldiers for a battle cause, but soldiers for the cause of preserving our history, have gathered. Frank Burke, Scott Bohm, and the Parker family of the 1st Arkansas Light Artillery are serving up a lesson besides the cannon fire. It's model of 1841. I enjoy it, you know, to be able to let them imagine what it was like or what it, what it could have been like uh, in the look in their eyes to the excitement and wanting to hear the cannon go off. Well, I love that concussion <laughs> uh, and the smoke and the smell of gunpowder and everything. We love the Arkansas State Parks. Uh, they're the best deal going for the spending of our tax dollars. That black powder's got too much force. Oh, it feels so good to be dressed up, period costume, in a period house, pretending that time is not as it is. You know, time just kind of stops for us when we come and play here at the park. On a porch that is 175 years old, making lace by hand still has a place. But it's best done, these ladies say, on this porch in a state park dedicated to history. Lace making, tatting, teaching a history lesson. Pick up two. Look at you. You're making it. History is something that I enjoy learning about and a lot of people don't like history. It's dry, it's dusty, it's dull. And this is one way to make history kind of come alive. Lessons for the next generation come not just from our state park workers, but from others as well. From volunteers who also understand the parks belong to all of us. I'm Bert Turner and I'm a uh, volunteer at Pinnacle Mountain State Park. Under a bridge in a state park, you can find a lesson. And then once I've got the stuff in the water, Bert Turner and two other volunteers are leading a 4-H club through a session on stream biology with Pinnacle Mountain Park interpreter Susan Staffeld. Turner is a retired Air Force pilot and now teaches college, but it's his free time that carries his most important lesson. At the end of the day, we may be tired, sore from working out, out on the trails, but it gives us a feeling that we accomplished something, and particularly when we're working with kids. It's a fall day at Pettyjean State Park where Arkansas State Park System was born. Well over 75 years have passed since this idea for a state park became a reality. And yet what inspired this all has not changed a bit. There are landscapes and values and traditions and history to be saved. Because we, as people, have this need to see it and experience it for ourselves. And so we preserve a way of life, a way of music, we offer a night's lodging, a place to decompress and relax. We teach children about the lessons of their state and the lessons of nature. We offer up the experiences so that you can create the memories. We have almost 10 million visitors a year, and it's about that memory in some very special places and special times with, with special friends and family. And that's what this is all about. It's, it's quality of life and it's quality of place. It's a place you can go just to have some fun and 
just escape from all the noise and everything. I think state parks are so important because there's nowhere else that you can go and be in a family environment and just create so many memories as you go. Um, and each park has something unique to offer. We need places like state parks where the families can come together and have uh, experiences that will make memories for a lifetime. I think we need state parks to remind us where we came from, how we got to where we are, and what's still important to us outside our daily routines. And to me, it's terribly important for people to appreciate and understand what makes us a wonderful state. And in my opinion, these parks are, are a great part of that.